In this episode of Real Chemistry, we're going to continue our discussion on naming ionic compounds. In this case, we're going to add metals from the D block. So in the last video, we didn't have any ionic compounds with metals from the D block. The D block is just that central part of the periodic table. I'll show you a picture in a second. And the reason that changes the naming is because recall that in our naming process in the previous video, a critical step was being able to predict the charge of our metal. And it turns out that in the D block, we can't predict the charge of our metal. So instead what we do is we specify it in our name. And that's why you see down here, iron three chloride with those Roman numerals there. That Roman numeral is telling us the charge on my iron, the things that comes before it. And it turns out since it shows us the Roman numeral three, that what we have is Fe three plus. So that's the main difference here between this video and the last is now we use Roman numerals on the metal since it's from the D block instead of predicting the charge from its position on the periodic table. So just a reminder here, this is the D block. It's those elements in the middle of the periodic table. And since we can't predict the charge there, we use Roman numerals on those metals. If you have metals that aren't in the D block, you don't need to use Roman numerals. So Roman numerals are only for metals in the D block. So let's go to our first example, which is FeCl3. What do we do? How is it different? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna predict the charge on our non-metal. And that we can do the same way we've done in previous videos because our non-metal isn't in the D block, it's hanging out on the parts of the periodic table where we can predict its charge. And so our non-metal in this case is Cl, remember that our non-metal always comes second, and the charge on chlorine is always negative one. And we know that from its position on the periodic table. If you haven't watched my video on predicting the uh, charge of ions, you need to do that first. So chlorine's negative one. So that's basically step one. We just determine the charge on the nonmetal. Step two is determine the charge on the metal. And the key thing we have to remember here is that our compound is neutral. And so we're gonna use the fact that our compound is neutral to figure out the charge on the metal. So our anions are charged with a negative one. So our chlorine is our anion and it has a negative one charge. How many chlorines are there? There's three. So our total negative charge is just three times our negative one. And that gives me a total negative charge of negative three. Why did I do that? Well, I need to know what my total negative charge is so that I can know what my total positive charge is. So if my total negative charge is negative three, then my total positive charge must be the same. So my total positive charge has to be equal and opposite to my total negative charge. So since I have negative three for all my negative stuff, I must have positive three for all my positive stuff. So that's how I determine the charge of my metal. I know that the charge of my iron is plus three because the charge on my non-metals, all of them combined, is negative three. So that means that I can go ahead and write plus three above my iron. It takes a little practice sometimes to get down that process of figuring out the charge. So we're gonna do a few more practice problems. Okay, now that we know the charge of both of the species, our rules for naming are very similar. We're gonna write the name of the metal, which we look up on the periodic table. So the name of the metal in this case is iron, which we can get from the periodic table. Now, what we add here is Roman numerals in parentheses to indicate the charge on iron. And that's why this, the step here where we determine the total charge was so important. So what we're gonna write is iron and then three in Roman numerals. And that three is telling us the charge on iron since we can't predict it from its position on the periodic table. Now we proceed to name it just like we would have when we were naming all the other ionic compounds. We're gonna write the base name of our second element, our non-metal, which is chlorine. Uh, and so the base name is chlor and then we're gonna add ide. So you can see that this process is a little more complicated because we have to figure out what the charge is on our metal. So let's do, do a few more practice problems. Okay, now we have CON. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start, as we always do, by predicting the charge of the nonmetal. And remember, our nonmetal always comes second. And if we go look at nitrogen, that's what this guy is, on the periodic table, we'll see that it has a charge of negative three. So our anions, which have a charge of negative three, tell us how positive the charge should be under cations. It should be equal and opposite. So that means that cobalt is plus three. And now you notice that if I add positive three to negative three, 
I get a neutral species. So I know now my charge on cobalt is plus three. So I've determined the charge on my metal, that's step two. And now I'm just gonna go, write, go ahead and write out the name just like I would have for non-D block metals. So CO is cobalt and I can find that on the periodic table. And now I add Roman numerals for the charge. And since my charge is plus three, I'm gonna put three Roman numerals. And then I'm gonna add the base name of nitrogen. which is NITR, and then I'm gonna add ide. So that's naming cobalt three nitride. All right, one more example of going from the chemical formula to the name, and then we're gonna go the other direction. So lead oxide, that's what that guy is, but we need to know what that Roman numeral is. So the first step, once again, is determine the charge on the nonmetal, and oxygen, based on its position on the periodic table, we know to have a negative two charge. Lead, we don't know, so that's what we have to figure out. Now, notice here that we don't just have one oxygen, but we have two. So the total negative charge we have here is negative two, but we have it twice. Why is that? Well, there's two oxygens in this compound, and each one has a negative two charge. That means that total, we have a negative four charge, and we can do that just by multiplying our negative two by the number of ions we have. So negative two times two gives me a negative four. So that tells me the total negative charge in my molecule. Now I need to figure out the total positive charge for my PB, or lead. And I know it has to be equal and opposite to my charge on oxygen. So that's going to be plus 4. All right, so I have minus 4 for my oxygen and plus 4 for my lead. That gives me a neutral compound, which is exactly what I want. And now I can go ahead and write down the name for my compound following the old rules. So the first thing I'm going to do is write lead. That's what PB is. We can find that on the periodic table. And now I'm going to have to write the Roman numeral for our charge. And I'm going to do that in parentheses. So Roman numeral for 4 turns out to be IV. And so you need to know the Roman numerals 1 through 4. So it's pretty straightforward. They go 1, line, 2 lines for 2, 3 lines for 3. 4 is the only one that's a little unique where you have a 1 and then the V. And that means 4. So we have lead 4. And then we're going to put the base name of our nonmetal, which is oxygen. And so the base name just turns out to be ox. And then we add ide. So we get lead for oxide. All right, now let's go the other direction. And I think you'll see that the other direction is actually more straightforward. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start with being given copper 2 oxide. And we're going to go back to our chemical formula of CuO. And this looks super similar to what we've already done. The only difference now is instead of predicting the charge of each of our ions, we're just straight up told the charge on our d-block metal. So in some ways, this is actually easier than the non-d-block metals when we're going from the name to the chemical formula. So the first thing we want to do is we want to write the chemical symbol for both, el both elements. So we look up copper on our periodic table, or let's be honest, probably Google, and we're going to put Cu because that's what copper is. And then we're going to look up the element symbol for oxygen or oxide, which turns out to be O. And now, just like we did before, we predict the charge of each ion. The difference now is we're going to predict the charge of the metal based on the Roman numeral. So the Roman numeral for copper, that's after copper here, is 2. So that gives me a plus 2 charge on my copper. Then oxygen, we know its charge by its position on the periodic table is negative 2. And then we follow the same last step we did in a previous video where we cross over that charge and reduce it if necessary. So we're going to take that 2 down here and this 2 down there, and that's going to give us copper 2, O2. Notice that we have a 2 to 2 ratio. A simpler version of a 2 to 2 ratio is just a 1 to 1 ratio. The reason that should make sense is that if I have one ion that's copper 2 plus and one ion that's oxygen 2 minus, if I just put them together, I'm going to get a neutral species. So the simplest way and the correct way to write this isn't Cu2O2, but CuO, where we just have one of each of our elements. All right, next example. Now we have chromium 2 bromide. Again, we're going to go ahead and write down the, speed, the symbol for each of these elements, which is CR in the case of chromium and BR in the case of bromide. We're going to go ahead and write down the charge on chromium, which we know is 2 from our Roman numeral, so we get plus 2 there. Bromine, we can predict that charge based on its position on the periodic table. It turns out to be minus 1. And then we cross over the charges. 
And so that's going to give us CR with a 1 down there, BR2. Oops, BR2. So you notice there that we can't simplify that ratio anymore. 1 to 2 is the simplest whole number ratio there. But again, we don't usually write that 1 because we're just assuming we have 1 chromium if I write 1 chromium. So that's how you write down chromium 2 bromide. All right, last example. Nickel 3 sulfide. Let's go ahead and find out the chemical symbol for nickel and sulfide, which turns out to be Ni and S, which we get from the periodic table. Our charge on nickel is given to us directly by these Roman numerals. It's plus 3. And our char charge on sulfide we can find from its position on the periodic table, which turns out to be minus 2. Then once again, we cross over those charges. So we're going to get Ni... 2s3. And notice we can't reduce a 2 to 3 ratio. That's the simplest whole number ratio. So we get nickel uh, sulfide is Ni2s3. And that's our final answer. So that does it for naming ionic compounds with metals not in the D block and in the D block. If you have any further questions, go ahead and ask them below. You can also visit my channel to see other videos on chemistry topics or subscribe to receive updates about chemistry videos.